Thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight. I'd like to share a little bit of uh, background um, as to uh, my personal story and how Jill and I met. Um, Eric is my son. He uh, died four years ago in February. And Eric, um, he struggled with addiction. He had an injury in high school. He had multiple surgeries. He um, became addicted to OxyContin and then transitioned to heroin. He uh, struggled with sobriety for a long time and then went into rehab and was sober for about a year. And then he relapsed. And at that point, he chose, chose to leave. And at the time, I come from a corporate background. And at the time, I had left corporate America to become a life coach because I wanted to help women in business. And Eric died halfway through my coach training program. And of course, uh, if you know, if you, you've experienced a loss like this, it takes you to your knees and is completely devastated. So I went ahead and completed my certification but the truth is my life was changed forever and I could never go back to who I was pre-Eric's de pre death. And um, we'll talk a little bit about this later in the presentation, but sometimes um, you know, when, you, when you find your child or your husband or spouse or partner, uh, it's treated as a crime scene. And of course I did find Eric and uh, they, they whisked me away and put me in a red fire truck and they handed me a package of information and there was a card in there. And that was Jill's card. And I was desperate for help. And so I called Jill and um, was able to get in to see Jill, um, you know, not too long after, after Eric's services. Um, and then Jill became a really, really big part of my healing journey. So Jill, why don't I let you take a minute or two and talk about you and your practice. Thank you, my friend. Um, it's always fun to get to work with you now and work alongside you in a very, very different role, right? Um, but so I'm, um, as Marianne said, I'm a licensed professional counselor. I specialize specifically in loss to suicide. So for the last 19 years, I have worked with families that have lost a friend or a family member or somebody important in their lives to suicide. It's kind of what I feel like is my purpose. One of my biggest purposes in life, aside from being a mother and a wife, um, but I'm very passionate about my work and it is something that I take very, very seriously. Mary and I, were, and I were speaking before you all joined us about Eric's house in general and um, how many people I refer to Eric's house and its cause because I believe in it and I believe in the passion behind it. And I, um, I'm so protective of my clients. She knows that I wouldn't send them um, unless I really know, knew that Eric's house um, was amazing and had yeah. really stand up services. So honored to kind of join together and do this tonight. Thanks, Jill. And one of the things you did for me was um, help me get through the very worst part of the journey. That's that initial, gosh, what has just happened? And, um, you know, eventually I learned uh, how to cope and just how to, how to be with it and just settle with the idea that, that Eric died. And so I'm so forever grateful uh, that you came into my life. So thank you. You're welcome. Right. There's always a delay on, um, there we go. So um, we just wanted to talk a little bit about why suicide grief is a little bit different. In fact, it's substantially different um, for a number of reasons. And that's not to diminish the fact that any loss is very difficult. And um, so we don't mean to minimize those, but there's some characteristics of suicide that make it um, complex and different than a natural death. And so one of them is the circumstances of the loss. 
and you know how it happened, who found the person, um, and then the emotional and physical reactions to the loss are um, considered very complex and um, hard to understand. And Jill, if you would like to talk a little bit about survivor questions and survivor guilt. Well, what, what I notice is one of the things that makes um, grieving the loss of a suicide so different on top of the trauma that is experienced, as Marianne, you just alluded to the circumstances of the loss, on top of that shock and that trauma, um, you know, once the dust settles, a survivor of suicide is left with that, why? And how do I find out the answers why? And how can I retrace the steps? And I want to look through the cell phone and I want to look through, you know, get into the computer and I want to figure out ways that I maybe could have done something differently, right? These mm -hmm. should have, could have, would have. Um, the should have, could have, would have are dangerous. But at the same time, I think it's really important for a survivor to um, know that they're really very normal. So I think as Marianne, Marianne and I are speaking tonight, um, we want to normalize some of these experiences so that when you have them, you don't think you're going crazy or you don't think you can as really um, you can. She's living, Miss Marianne is living proof and, and I've met hundreds of others, but the why is something that sits on our shoulders after we lose somebody to suicide. And what we're trying to do is make something that was illogical, logical. Yeah. So, right, Marianne, what yeah, you it's say? Great, it's a great way to put it. And, you know, for me, uh, I did exactly what you said. I started building spreadsheets of who he talked to and when he talked to them and trying to find somebody who was responsible for it, somebody to blame. And um, I, I don't know why he chose to do it because I had just spoken with him the night before. So something happened and I've just learned now to be patient with that. It's an unresolved question in my heart and I've learned to be patient with all things um, that I don't understand about his death. And so that, um, that comes with time. I, I tell you, it takes a, a while to get there, but you do eventually get there because it, you, you have no power or control over the loss. And so for me, I've learned to just be okay with it and just be patient. Maybe someday I'll wake up and I'll know, but it's okay even if I don't. I would say that that resolution is just part of the process, yeah. right? Resolving, like you just said, that you may never find the answer to why. You have to go through the process of trying to figure it out, right? Yeah. And then maybe you just wake up one day and go, I, I don't know if I have the stamina to keep searching because I don't know if I'll ever find it. Right. Yeah. Right. And there's so many other very important things to do as well as right. you begin to come out the other end. Um, one of the things that I definitely experienced was stigmatization and isolation. So for, for a long time, I really didn't even want to see anybody or talk to anybody. And I have to honestly say, I did isolate myself because that's where I felt good. Um, but my friends today are not the same friends I had before. In fact, I always talk about it. Where were all the friends I had before Eric died? But at the same time, I also feel blessed that I have this whole new beautiful set of friends um, that understand the loss and that I understand their losses as well. And the stigmatization part, for a long time, I refused to speak about it, right? Mm -hmm. I refused to talk about Eric's death because it was a double whammy. It was not only a heroin addiction, it was a suicide. And I felt like I must have done something wrong in my raising of Eric. And so I wanted to protect his legacy and I didn't want people to know. Can I comment on that really quickly? At, at knowing you in, in the therapeutic setting at that time, right? The clinician and, and, and the client, um, you bring up a really good point about not bringing up Eric's suicide. And I think in in your case and a lot of cases marianne part of that was out of protection for eric no right yeah right Completely. 
We just yeah. lost, we just lost one of the most important people in our lives. Mm -hmm. And how, how could we ever, um, say anything that could be hurtful or disparaging or all we, we already feel like we failed at protecting them. Right. So we're 100% going to protect them in their absence. Right. And that, that causes a lot of survivors to be silent where really I love to see them talk and mm -hmm. oh, despair. Yeah. Air. We have, I think we had a little interruption of service there. I'm back up. Okay, good. Thanks. So um, there are a few other things, and I'll go through these uh, really quickly. Um, you know, the family relationships changed a little bit. They could have gotten worse, but in fact, they became stronger. That took work from every member of our family. Um, and I already talked about it being treated like a crime, but post-traumatic stress for me was really, really big. Um, and I eventually did go for EMDR uh, and that helped tremendously, but finding your loved one causes a whole nother layer of a complication in your recovery to grief. And then the last thing is, oh my gosh, it's like confusion and chaos everywhere you turn. Nothing seemed right, nothing seemed normal. And I know, Jill, that's really... That's par for the course. How it is. Yeah, yeah. that's really... And um, what I say to most people um, is that your snow globe has just been turned upside down, right? Mm -hmm. And so by the time that shock and denial wears off, your snow globe's been set back up, but now all the debris is just falling and it's falling into a different order than it was yeah. before. So oh. I think we go into that a little bit in the next slide. Yeah. That chaos and that confusion. Um, and just to piggyback while we're doing that um, as to what we just spoke about regarding your PTSD and your post-traumatic stress, some of that chaos and that confusion is very normal. I think anybody, and I'm assuming that, that most people that are joining us tonight most, maybe not all. Um, but it's important to remember that when you've experienced a sudden loss like that, especially a loss to suicide or addiction for that matter, um, your brain is traumatized. Mm -hmm. So it is not functioning as it should be, nor should you expect it to function how it did six months ago or even two years ago. So mm -hmm. it's almost as the pieces of the puzzle in your brain have all been moved and shifted and like forced back into place. Yeah. So things are going to see seem incong incongruent. Um, they're gonna feel very, very different. So that chaos is normal, but you're already grieving and hurting. Yeah. And now you feel unsettled on top of it, right? Again, your brain's gonna go through that loop. We saw it, Marianne, of the should have, would have, could have. Let me go back and figure out, you know, where did I miss the ball somehow? Um, you can have flashes or relive that moment. That's a part of that post-traumatic um, stress. And you, you mentioned something different, Marianne, you're right. When you actually visually see um, your loved one or find your loved one, that is stored in your brain differently. Yeah. That is a additional barrier that you have to break through. But what I have learned in this work is that for even those family members that weren't present, right? And you had to call Rob or, you know, a husband has to go to the house and tell his wife. For those people that weren't on scene or didn't find their loved one, it also creates a very different storyboard in their mind. Yeah. So they create their own movie reel. And that could be just as bad, if not worse, in all honesty. Yeah. So um, it's, it's, there's a real need after a traumatic loss to kind of flush that out. Of course, there is a fear that life will never be normal again, or that we'll never be able to experience joy again. I remember hearing that from you a time or two. Um, and who am I now? What's what, you know, we talked about families a minute ago 
and how families change. Well, if you went from a family of five to a family of four, all of the roles have changed in the family. There's been a huge shift. If you, if you lost a child, um, I have a couple clients who have lost their only children mm-hmm. and they will say to me, am I even a mother anymore? Right. If you lost your spouse, am I, am I a husband? Am I a wife? Am I an aunt? Am I a girlfriend? Um, and that's really scary on top of all of it. That's what makes a loss to suicide so different. Yeah. Well, I know for me, uh, the who am I now uh, was already playing out in my head from leaving my previous work to do something entirely different. Um, And that was a big struggle for me. I really, really struggled with what am I going to do now? And also, uh, Jill, in my case, I had been caring for Eric as an addict. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And, and if so you then were a I, caregiver, what were you then, right? Right, exactly, to your point. So, um, yeah, those are all, all really common questions. And um, eventually, eventually you sort through them. It does take a little time, but you do sort through them. But it's really important to try to sort through them one at a time. So I think yes. what's happening, right, in that moment is it all feels urgent because you physically don't feel like you can breathe. So you're trying to answer all of these questions at one time. And as you just said earlier, Marianne, like time works a lot of it out, but you need to take, you need to take it one question at a time instead of trying to solve the whole puzzle with a blindfold on. Right. And you know what, Jill, we get, you know, with our clients inside Eric's house, we very often get the question, you have to fix me. Yeah. How do we fix this? Yeah. And yeah. I would love so much just to be able to flip the switch and have everybody be fixed, but it's hard work. This right. is hard work. You have to do the hard work of going through your grief and mourning the loss of the person you lost so that you come out okay at the other end when you're yeah. ready. Yeah. And sometimes that hard work is really just having faith and getting up every day. Sometimes that's the hard work. Um, You know, I'm sure you've had this experience at Eric's house as well, but along with what can you do to fix me? There's a lot of what's the formula. Just give me a plan and I will follow it. I'm so good at following plans, right? Fix me. Will you give me a, give me a formula? And I wish, I wish I could give them a formula. There is none. There's this patience and belief that the person, this is what's so great about Eric's house and survivors being with survivors, that the person that's sitting across from you has survived it so you can survive it or the person right. sitting next to you, right? So sometimes the hard work is just believing that it can be and getting up, waking up every single day and just yeah. continuing to go. Yeah. That's hard. I did want to make, make one more comment though on this slide. Um, we also get the question about, I, you know, if I laugh, I mm-hmm. feel guilty. Yeah. And so I, I don't want to be happy because I don't want to feel guilty. Mm-hmm. So we get that question a lot. Um, and we also get the question about, what was that? I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. We also get the question about what if, you know, I start feeling better and then I forget her Mm -hmm. or him. What if I forget they ever existed? I think that's a, that's a process of the grief as well. Um, I just had this conversation with a client last week. As a matter of fact, there is this irrational belief that if we are healing, we are leaving our loved ones behind. Mm -hmm. And I think you and I are going to talk on this a little bit later about the relationship that we can still have with our person. But, you know, there is, you bring up a really good point. If I go out for pizza and I enjoy that pizza, what's wrong with me? Because 
Tony can't ever enjoy pizza again. And oh my gosh, I just laughed. Now I feel guilty for laughing, right? Mm -hmm. So you just imprison yourself. Mm -hmm. You decided that you're going to stay in that jail cell forever because if you experience joy again, um, you must be a horrible person. Yeah. 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 Well, you explain it so clearly and plainly. Um, I've, I've walked a couple clients through it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so this slide talks about uh, coping strategies. I know one of the very first things you said to me, Jill, was um, go outside and sit in the sun. And that, that was one of the most important things I did to help myself. You went to the beach. Well, I did go to the beach. That's a whole nother story. Yeah. <laughs> That is a whole, that's you having a relationship with your son. Yeah, exactly. Um, so new research has come out and I'm sure you've heard about it. New research has come out in the last two years, several different stories, several different studies that support that nature is actually more potent than any antidepressant you will ever take. Yeah. It's important. I believe that. It engages, and so much of, of what um, the holistic approach of Eric's house, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's engaging the body with the mind. And in a time where you and I have said, your mind so desperately is scrambled and it wants to shut down, we kind of have to jumpstart it intentionally. Yeah. And getting those endorphins going um, for five, 10, 15 minutes every day is the easiest thing that you can do to jumpstart those hormones and those endorphins mm -hmm. to combat the depression that could very easily seep into every, you know, pore of your being yeah, after yeah. losing somebody to suicide. Yeah. The, the next one with the talking it out repeatedly, um, you know, we did a lot of that mm -hmm. ourselves, right? And I have an amazing mentor that always says, talk it, draw it, or write it, because sometimes trauma gets stuck right here. Yeah. Chakras, gene chakras, right? Sometimes it gets stuck right here. And so sometimes we find that we can't say the words. Maybe it's because that stigma that you were talking about earlier. Maybe it's because we don't think anybody can understand because they haven't experienced it themselves. Maybe we want to protect ourselves or protect our loved ones. But um as often as you can empty the trash can, yeah. you will present yourself from cracking or breaking down as well. Yeah. And I think I even said it to you once or twice, Marianne, I said, if you break down, what happens to everybody else, right? Okay. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I went through this, Jill, where, um, and, and we see it in a lot of our clients, it's too painful to talk. Yeah. It's just too painful. And so you tend to isolate. And that is what happened to me is I, I just didn't really want to talk about it except with you. Right. Really. And um, it, it, it is really painful, but I think there's plenty of research that shows to the, your point about grief getting stuck here. There's a whole process of making meaning of the loss and talking it out brings you closer and closer and closer to integrating the loss into your life. And so it's very right. important to just keep talking. Doesn't even need to make sense. It just, you just need to talk. To anybody or everyone. And if they can't handle it, they can't handle it because that's a part of your process now. It doesn't mean you're going to talk about it forever, right? right? It means there is something that needs to be released. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, the next one affirming affirming support. You and I, I think the first time that we um, presented together, I think it was the very first Eric's House workshop, if you can remember way back then. Um, find your army. Find your army. And your army may not be the people that you thought would be by your side. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I don't have less respect for those people. They're just not equipped. Right. So find your army. That may be only two people. It may be three people, but let, you know, if they'll let you talk about it again and again and again, and they're not afraid of you or afraid of it, they're your army. Yeah. And, you know, I um, had never known anybody to lo lose somebody to suicide. Wow. So wow. 
I re didn't have a loss, another loss survivor to talk to except a group. Yeah. And um, that's one of the reasons why we think Eric's house is, is really um, very special because we do bring loss survivors into the mix to help other loss survivors get through the journey. Extremely cathartic. Yeah. Exploring new relationships can we, I, you know, I know that we're against a clock, but I would like to comment on that briefly and, and see where you are on that now, four years out, Marianne, it would be good for me to kind of hear your perspective on it. I will say that I have learned um, through this work and I probably didn't have the same perspective 10 years ago that I do now. Um, but I do, if you have a belief that you can continue to have a relationship, some relationship with Eric um, or whomever it may be, that this grief journey um, goes more smoothly. I don't know how else to say that. I know there are some people that believe in a faith and some people that don't. Um, research, which is boring, but research would show you that those with a faith um, have an easier time with traumatic loss, which is all horrible, um, than if they don't have a faith. But in my work, and there's been, you know, hundreds of views, I have, I learned from you guys. Mm -hmm. And I sit back and I watch and those people that still have a relationship, it may look different. I've lost people in the last 20 years. My relationship with them looks different, but I still talk to them, right? I still, I still think, what would he think about this? How would he handle this situation? I still bring them into daily living because I believe that I can still make them a part of my life, even though they aren't physically here. So I just ask anybody who's listening to be conscious about that, to be intentional about that, to think of ways in which you can still make a loved one a part of your life. Um, I, have a, I have a new client that I've actually gained since the pandemic, so I haven't been able to meet her personally, but she lost her son about nine months ago and she was struggling a little bit a few weeks back. And I said, what do you think's changed? And she said, I've stopped talking to his picture. Mm -hmm. I used to get up every single morning and kiss it and say good morning and talk to him for a bit. And I've been so mad at God and I've been so mad at him or just, not mad at him, but just mad that I haven't been speaking to him and I don't feel him and I feel more disconnected from him. And the minute she made that switch, she's still a grieving mom, Yeah, exactly. but she feels more peace in her heart. Right? right. Do you, what, what's your experience with that personally? Well, um, so the, the question about faith is a whole nother session. And I think it's a very worthy topic because it's been a very interesting journey for me um, but the question about being in a relationship with yeah. Eric, right? So it's a learning process. I mean, I've learned to have a very physical relationship with Eric since the day he, I conceived him, really. And so now I've, I've had to and am continuing to learn to be in a relationship with him in a different way. Right. And however you define that way is unique to you. Um, and it can be, I'm angry with him. It could be, I miss you so much, Eric. It could be, you know, he used to um, pick clothes out for me. He was kind of like my, my fashion kid, right? Um, you know, asking him what I should wear or what's up or telling him about my family or, or whatever. So wherever you are in your relationship with him is exactly where you're supposed to be but you're just learning how to be with your loved one in a different way than you've ever had to do before. How to do it differently. But yes, beautiful. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and the last comment on PTSD, you, you know, I'm a big fan of getting support if you have PTSD because it can, it's a, it can be a game changer for you in your journey. EMDR um, works wonders, wonders. 
Yeah, so between you and Sonia Sobo, who's also on the Eric's House team, uh, she did my AMDR and it, it, it just opened up a whole new set of possibilities for my, my recovery. Um, okay, so now this is about the transformational nature of, of grief. Uh, I always describe my experience as um, having my life broken into millions of shards of glass. And everything I knew to be true about life was not true. So everything was shattered. And I had to pick up piece by piece by piece each piece of glass and construct a new vessel to carry my heart, my soul, my spirit. And then those questions that come in, well, how do I rebuild? Where do I start? What is my new normal going to look like? Those are such long-term questions. The point for me was to just take a step every day, take a step forward. And as you begin to tell your story, um, and as you begin to move forward a little bit at a time, backwards a little bit, forward again, backwards, forward, you, you can begin to envision a new mosaic for, you, for yourself, what, what life can be for you. And chances are, it's not going to be the same as it was before because you're so fundamentally changed. We good there? We're good. I could, I'm not. I'm not saying a word because you said it so well. Mm -mm. <laughs> Nothing needed there, right, my now, friend. You know, um, there's a lot of models out there. Uh, I get often asked how what's going to happen is what I'm feeling normal. Um, how long is this going to last? Will it be done in a year? Will it be done in three years? You know, there's no answers to those questions, but the Venn diagram that you see on the chart is something that I created um, as a result of my own experience. It has no clinical or scientific basis at all. The first phase for me is I just didn't want to acknowledge it. I just didn't want to believe it really happened. I still thought Eric was going to text me. And that lasted a very, very long time for me. Once I got past that, I began to accept it. It really did happen. He really is not coming back. Once I got past that stage, then I began to adapt to the idea that he's not here and that I needed to move forward with my life. And that journey, I love the analogy of the ocean because that journey of ebbing and flowing, um, I describe a tidal wave and you just you can't swim up for air some days and other days it's a beautiful calm beach and so i love that quote by vicki harrison i won't read it um but you know there are people that that can help and you know i can't imagine going through this journey without my army of people and jill said that get your army together and she was a big member she was like the general in my army and so um, there are things that you can do um, to help yourself. And the first is to find somebody to talk to. We use the term grief companioning. We have grief specialists inside Eric's house that are also lost survivors in many cases. And they can just sit with you and listen and companion you, hold your hand throughout the journey until you're ready to let go. Group support, you know, there's, um, there's amazing groups in every city in this country. And we have some great ones in Phoenix. There's great ones in other states as well. But group groups help. Um, but find a good group that works for you, a group that does bring you calm and comfort because it, it's so helpful to be around other people with a common experience. Counseling for sure. If you feel like you need professional counseling, there's great ones out there. And I know Jill, you can make a lot of, a lot of recommendations because yes, you have a, a network all over the country, trauma That's specialists, true. especially for PTSD. We have a, um, a couple of uh, medical doctors on our, on our board, but we also have some um, naturopathic um, doctors and nurse practitioners on the board. So uh, they can help treat the body um, as well as the heart and soul. 
And then we do a number of holistic things. You know, we often forget about our body, which is what I did. I just focused on fixing my broken heart and, you know, having my brain make sense of what happened. Um, but I completely ignored my body and the effect that grief has on the body. So uh, it's very important to recognize where you're feeling your grief and do something for self-care, body, mind, spirit. And so reach out to people that, that can help with that. And let's see where we are. I'm going to comment real quick while you're switching sides on the, on the body. Um, because that's a big movement with me as of recently. Um, there is a lot of information that will support that trauma and grief sits all over your body. It sits not just in your gut, not just your shoulders, but it really can, you know, take house in a, in a joint. If you have a shoulder pain that won't go away or knee pain that won't go away, your, or your vagus nerve, which goes from the stem of your brain, you know, across in front of your heart down to your core shortens. So that feeling that all of us get when we're grieving, where we can't, we literally feel like we can't breathe. You guys, that's, that's actually biological. You know, you're in fight or flight after experiencing a very devastating loss. So you have this nerve that shortens and it moves all of your organs together. So Reiki or yoga or massages to me are almost, they almost need to be prescribed with the talk therapy because we can open up. If you can't open up this, this block in your, in your throat, right. Or you can't seem to talk about it up here because it's too painful. There are other ways to let out the pain and the tension and the hurt if you can't do it here. Um, so, you know, I'm a believer that I think body work, it's most advantageous if there is body work going along with the, the psychological, emotional support as well. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, lesson learned for me, because I, I, didn't, I didn't care at all about what my body was oh, doing. Sure. You know, that, that was a mistake. Okay, well, Jill, uh, thank you as always.